Hey guys, Charles here, back again with another video, and this is the third part in our series of composing parts for The Battle Belongs. Basically, we just chose that song at random, but came up with parts that weren't part of the original song, just to demonstrate how you can come up with rhythm parts as well as lead guitar parts. Now in this video, we are going to look at the lead part that I played. If you're not yet subscribed to the channel, make sure you subscribe, hit the bell icon, you'll get notifications whenever we release new videos just like this one. And with that said, let's hop right into this lesson. All right, so let's play the lead guitar part together with the rhythm part, and then we'll come and break down the lead part. All right, so basically, the rhythm guitar part started here on the D flat. I'm doing the same thing, but with an octave. And then I'm going up to the 11th fret and then down to the 10th fret to basically mirror that part there. Okay, this isn't so much a hook line that's gonna stand out, but if you're in the two guitar band, this is something nice to add that upper level, upper register, right? To kind of take that orchestral approach that I spoke about in the previous video. All right, so as you can see, it's the same part, rhythmic part as the rhythm guitar. Just pay very close attention to your string muting because that sounds great, but this, not so much, right? So you wanna make sure that you're muting this, the idle strings. Especially when you move up the neck. Okay, and what helps for me when I move up the neck is to use my first finger to kind of be my guide, because then you just know as long as you move your first finger to the 11th fret, the fourth finger will be fine. Rather than trying to think of both fingers. Again, uh, that's that concept of anchoring. Um, that can really help you a ton there. All right, so now let's check out the verse part. So in this verse, I decided to use what would probably be known as an ostinato, which is a repetitive uh, rhythmic or repetitive phrase, okay, in music. So I just played for all the chords, I just stayed on this, I just stayed on that one note, right? So what note is that? Well, that is a D flat, which is obviously the, the root, okay? of D flat, then it's the fifth of G flat, then it's the minor third of B flat, and it's the the, the sus four of A flat. Okay, that's kind of cool. So this would be D flat, G flat, with a D flat, B flat minor, and then A flat, there's something soothing about that. There's We've got chords changing, we've got lots of stuff going on, but then this one guitar part is saying, listen, I'm just gonna hang on this one note and create a bit of a glue over these chords. And rhythmically, I mean, I kind of played it different every time, but... So even if I, if, even if I was to add just a bass note, 
in a G flat. And then a B flat. And then an A flat. Okay, and it's obviously just there for, for two beats. So that is a kind of a fun thing to do when you can find the note that kind of works over multiple chords. All right, and in this case, that D flat worked over all four of those chords. And even though when we played the A flat, it was technically the fourth and not one of the main triad chord tones, it works because it's you've heard it so many times, it actually works over that chord. All right, so nothing to it, nice and simple. It's a rhythmic approach to melody, right? We've done, we've spoken about that on this channel a lot, like rhythmic solos or uh, bringing in some, some strong rhythmic uh, drives when it comes to playing lead parts. All right, so with that said, let's go and check out the down chorus. So what I did there is very simple, just a swell on the D flat, which worked very well over both the G flat and the D flat. And then I went to an E flat, which is the fifth of the A flat. And I, I slide that up to the 10th fret, which is an, an F, which is the fifth of the B flat. So just these three notes, D flat, E flat, F, and it's up to you how you want to phrase those. You can keep it very simple. Or you can add some melodic phrases to that. So there's nothing to it. You can just swell your notes in there. Pay attention to what the vocals are doing so you don't get into in the way of the vocals. Like when they're not singing, there's a gap that's kind of a good time for a melodic swell to come in there. Because you don't want to, since the vocals are singing a melody, you don't want to play something that's going to clash with that melody. Um, so it's normally a good idea to leave space for the vocals to sing where they want to sing or where the song is singing, right? The, the melody line, and then you can add something in the gaps there. All right, after that, we are back into the intro as well as the verse. So we've already looked at both of those parts. So when we go to that bigger chorus, there was like a simple melodic phrase that I played. Okay, so it's a sweet descending major scale line, right? So remember, we're on the key of D flat. Okay, so all that's happening there is we are the chords. Remember, the chords were G flat, D flat, A flat, B flat, minor. So I just played. So I'm just going down the major scale, starting on the G flat. So it's fret 13, sorry, fret 14, 13, 16, 14, and then on the second bar, 1E and a 2E and. And then you don't have to do this, but. I had a descending line and a little bit of a... Like a little bit of a legato phrase there. All right, so you can see the tabs on screen. 14, 13, 16, 14, 13, 14, 16. Same thing. So for the descending part, it's just 14, 13, 13, because that is over that A flat chord. All right, so it's quite simple, nothing to it. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to use that little run up there, but if you want to, that can be quite fun. All right, and then there is a section 
And you'll just have to listen to where I did it, but I had a repetitive phrase, right? Which is this. So what's happening there? It's just 13 hammering on to 14. Then I pick 16, because I already had that in my line. Okay, that kind of repetitive melodic phrase typically tends to work quite well. And I believe I play that over the G flat. Now, if you wanted to get technical about the chord tones, yes, this is a C, which then hammers on to the D flat. All right, so it's a sharp 11 over that four chord. And then this nine here, that A flat is the ninth of the G flat. And then over the A flat, while the D flat, I played D flat, hammering to the E flat. So then again, I get that ninth, so. So the A flat gives me the ninth over the G flat chord. And then the E flat gives me the ninth over the D flat chord. Okay, so I use the ninth in both of those scenarios. Okay, let's just play that one part just where that features that little line. And that's really all there is to it, with the only difference is with the bridge. Remember when we talked about the bridge, we said we wanted to have these different gears. So the first time, we didn't really play anything um, in the bridge, right, on the lead guitar part. The second time around, I just played four two voicings, all right? So, but I played it higher up the neck. So instead of G flat over here, it was G flat over here. With a little bit of a hammer on, and then to the D flat. The A flat. The B flat minor. Back to the A flat. Okay, and now kicking it up a gear again because we kind of need to have a third part to go to there. I just took those same voicings, but I just played an eighth note down picked pattern with the higher notes. So remember, these are my chords G flat, D flat, A flat, B flat minor to A flat. So I just played. Okay, and then for the tag over the G flat and the D flat, I play that little line I showed you earlier. So nothing to it. It's simply the major scale with that descending part, right? The slight variation at the end, and then four two voicings. And then the same four two voicing, but just playing the higher note. and then that little repetitive pattern at the end. That is all I did in that part. That's a perfect kind of part for a second lead guitar. If you are the only guitarist, right, you're probably gonna do more of the rhythmic stuff, but you can bring in some of the lead stuff. Uh, just don't stay there the whole time because you're gonna miss the bottom end that you're gonna need to fill that frequency in the tonal landscape, so to speak. All right, guys, so hopefully, that's helpful as it relates to some of the lead guitar parts that I did there and to kind of show you how I made some of those decisions. In order to make this work, you really need to understand your chord tones and how they relate with the actual chords. 
and then have a good understanding of how you can play melodies with the use of chord tones, but then also use non-chord tones for some melodic interest. This is something that we looked at in great detail whenever we teach along the subject of melodic math, which is almost like a paint by numbers approach to show you what notes work well and what notes are gonna add some spice to your playing. So if you wanna learn more about these kind of techniques and my approach to modern worship guitar when it comes to composing parts or when it comes to practicing or developing your technique or your tone or whatever the case may be, we teach all of this at our Worship Guitar Skills Academy and you can just check a link in the description box which will lead you to uh, somewhere that you can sign up to find out more about the Worship Guitar Skills Academy if you want to dive deeper and study some of these concepts in greater detail. All right, guys, thanks again for watching. Have a great one. Hope this lesson has been helpful. Hit us up in the comments and let us know what you enjoyed about the lesson and what you'd like to see more of in future because then we'll come right back to the studio and film new lessons that will help you develop your worship guitar skills. Have a great one, and I'll see you in the next video.